about an offer. It's all about gifts. And uh, years ago, I remember my dad got a vacuum for my mother. What a great gift. A gift that keeps on giving. This gift will give you a gift every time you use it. It will give you the gift of a clean house. You know, the men are not renowned for our gift giving. You know, if they, oh, you know, my wife would love this iron board, an iron. My shirts would be nice and iron. It would be a great gift. I'm particularly bad at giving gifts. And I am absolutely <coughs> terrible at it. And in fact, I just go, okay, just tell me what you want. Let's look on Amazon and pick it out and we'll get click together. Bye, all right. <laughs> and I just have to remember to wrap it because many times my gifts come pre-wrapped in a Walmart shopping bag. It's wonderful. Or an Amazon box already taped up. It's perfect. Even has their name on it. <laughs> it's definitely not a perfect gift. I'm not a good gift giver. There's many imperfect gifts. But we were given a perfect gift. Everyone was given a perfect gift. And that gift is found in Philippians chapter 2. Please turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Read with me Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, giving him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of whose in, those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Father God, as we open your word, as we dig inside your word to find out what it has for us, I pray you open our hearts, open our minds to what your word has to say, that we may apply it to our lives, that we will not blindly listen and walk out and forgetting what we've heard, but we'll ponder on it, we'll think about it, and we'll see how we need to apply it to our lives. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The perfect gift was Jesus. The perfect gift with Jesus, and it's a gift that will continually to keep on giving. But this gift is not a regular gift. This gift was gift of salvation. But it didn't come in royalty. You know, there's a, a story of a family in Connecticut, or a town in Connecticut, a very rich town outside of New York that when kids turn 16, they got a official used car, but when they graduated high school, they got to choose a car, a brand new car, any car they want. And that was just their tradition in the town. They, everyone got a new car when they graduated. Well, this one family brought his son to the car lot and said, what car would you like? And the son picked out this nice red Mustang. Perfect. There's everything about the car. He wanted to work. So everything was perfect. He's like, this is the car. And his dad said, you know, I really want you to come to church with me this Sunday. No, no, dad, I'm busy, I'm busy. And every day, or every week, his dad said, I really like you to come to church. And his son continually said no. Well, graduation came. And his son woke up, looked out the window. There was no car. So he went down to the garage, opened the door, no car. And he said, oh, maybe, maybe he's getting me clean. Well, that night, at dinner, his son couldn't wait any longer. He said, Dad, do you have anything for me? And his dad handed him a box. And it was not the small little box that you would expect a pair of keys in, or a set of keys. It was a big box, a box that contained a book. And his son opened it up, hoping to find the keys, and inside it 
was a Bible. And his son got so mad, he shut the box, threw it, cussed out his dad, and walked out. He didn't turn back. Years later, his dad, his dad and his son, they just they never got along after that. And there was just a rift. And his son was just so angry that his dad would take him to a car lot, choose a car, but never buy it. Well, his dad died. And his son was going through the things and he found that box from all those years ago. And he opened it. And he just going down memory, thinking about how angry he was, and he opened the Bible and in the first page it said, Son, I love you so much. And I want to give you a gift that is just going to give you so much more of a And so this Bible is for you. And if you read it, you'll get so much more. And also, your car is at your grandmother's house waiting for you. It wasn't packaged right. It wasn't packaged right, so he threw it away. When we look for Jesus, when many people are looking for God, they're looking for something so spectacular that it blinded. When Jesus was born, he was born in a stable. If you don't really know what a stable would smell like, go to Tony's house. Not his house. I didn't phrase that. <laughs> go to Tony's house. It's a stable. Go to where his donkeys are. <clears throat> Imagine having a baby where a donkey's standing. Chickens walking around. A pig here and there. A cow looking at you. Chewing its cud. Moo. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to have my baby right here. I think this is a spot. It was the lowest of the lows. See, the perfect gift was his, was God's humility. The perfect gift was God's humility. It says this in Philippians two, chapter five, or chapter two, verses five through seven. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. We have to remember that he was equal with God. Verse 6 says, he was equal with God. He didn't think it was robbery to be found equal with God. Meaning, when he looked at God, he said, yeah, that's me. When Satan did that, when Satan said, I am like God, God cast him down. It said, you're done here. When Jesus did it, God's like, yeah, you're right. The God that created the heavens and earth humbled himself to the point of being born in a stable surrounded by animals and their filth. He humbled himself. The perfect gift was humble. Was humble. The perfect gift was humble. How many people missed it? They were looking. The, some of the disciples, like Judas Iscariot, he was looking for a warrior. And he was given a servant. The gift that God gave us was his son. And we see his humility. But this wasn't something that he had to do. In verse 7, it says that it was a willing choice. It says this, But God demonstrated... There we go. Sorry about that. It says, in verse 7, it says, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. He made himself. He didn't say God made him do it. He made himself. How many times do people make us do something? Go take out the trash. Well, a lot of times men are told take out the trash. Why? Because we didn't do it when the trash was full. There are two trash bags sitting next to the door for me to take out. I saw those yesterday. And I'll hit their trash bags right there. <laughs> Last night, there's another trash bag there. Huh. Multiply. <laughs> if I don't take it out soon, I'm going to have this conversation, John, take out the trash. 
I'm to be told to do it. And once I'm told to do it, I have an option, right? I can say no, which would be a very bad idea. <laughs> or I could say, all right, Katie, sorry to take that sooner. And take it out. Being told to do something is a lot different than choosing to do it. Jesus chose. He chose humility. He chose sacrifice. He chose to become man. His gift was a gift of humility. It was his choice to do it, and it was his choice to be a servant. Not only did he choose humility, he chose a sacrifice. This is what it says in verse 8. It says, And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He chose to die for you. He wasn't forced to die, and he chose his death. And what we know of Roman <coughs> crucifixion is that it was the perfect torture device. What the Romans would do when they would crucify someone, it wasn't, oh, we need to do capital punishment, let's kill someone today. It was to show people that this is what happens when you disobey the Romans. When you rebel, when you break our laws, this. And not, he didn't just get nailed to a cross, he got beat first. When he was whipped, the cat of nine tails would hit his back, wrap around to his front, and then rip the skin off. So he had very little skin on his back. And then he was put on a cross. We have crosses out in our yard right now. There's three of them. They're nice and smooth. They're not rough. The Romans would not have sanded into crosses and made sure they're comfortable. They didn't care. And Jesus, knowing what kind of death lay in store for him, suffocation, brutal torture, a crown of thorns being shoved on his head, he chose that. He said, yeah, that's what I want to do. The God of creation said, you know what? I'm going to humble myself. Not only am I going to humble myself, I'm going to choose the worst possible death. That's a gift I want to give people. And we have to ask ourselves, what kind of gift is that? This gift of death. Well, his gift of death, he chose to die. Why did he do that? Because his gift he was giving us was life. By Jesus choosing death, by choosing to be humble to the point of death, he chose to give us eternal life. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says this, But God demonstrated His love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. We are all sinners. At one time in our lives, we have sinned. I know right now some of you are thinking, well, you don't know me. Oh, you're a sinner. No one had to teach you to lie to your parents. Did you just eat that lollipop off the ground? No. <laughs> Why do you have a lollipop sick in your hand? Found it that way. <laughs> Did you just eat that cookie? No. no. The dog came up here, ate that cookie. <laughs> Are you sure? Because you have chocolate on your face. You were born that way. <clears throat> we don't have to teach our kids to lie. They do it naturally. We don't have to teach our kids to disobey. You know, every kid is going to have that moment. Nathaniel's going to have this moment one day. He's going to look at us. Say, Nathaniel. Don't touch that. Nathaniel, don't touch that. No. Why didn't you do that, dude? We don't have to teach our children to sin. They do it naturally. We all have sinned. We all sin. But yet, while we were yet sinners, while we were in direct disobedience to God, God gave us a gift of life. He gave us a gift of life. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Because we are sinners, we are eternally separated from God. There is a big gap between us and God. And that gap is our sins. God is a holy God, a perfect God, and He cannot be in the presence of sin. We are sinners. We've rebelled against God, and there is a penalty to that. And it's eternal damnation in hell. 
eternal damnation in hell. And there's no way out. You can't be good enough to get out of hell because you're a sinner. Well, you joke, no, John, I give a lot of money to the church. You're still going to hell. I'm a really nice person. I'm, everyone loves me at work. You're still going to hell. But, John, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. Because you're a sinner. Your sins, your choice to, re, to not reconcile with God is sending you to hell. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 says this. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, when we were enemies, while we were sinners, Jesus died for us. Why? So we can be reconciled with God. He died for us so that we can be reconciled with God. He goes on to say this. Through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. See, when Jesus died, He was the perfect sacrifice. He never sinned. And when He died, He paid for your sins. God said His sacrifice covers your sins. But you know what? It's a choice. Jesus died for your sins. You're a sinner. He's providing a way of salvation. But there's a choice. You have to choose to accept the gift. If I say, Cameron, this remote control is yours. Here it is. And she never once picks up that remote control. Is it truly hers? No. She doesn't have control over it. It's just sitting right there. Jesus died for your sins and He's saying, Here, accept my payment. Recognize that you're a sinner and accept my payment for your sins. And you will be saved. You have to accept me. You have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Son of God. It's not enough for you to believe. The demons believe and shudder. You have to confess and say, God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I accept your payment for my sins. See, Jesus gave us a gift of humility and sacrifice. He chose to be a servant. A servant to die on the cross for your sins. And now we have a responsibility. Our responsibility is this. Accept or reject Him. There's only two options. Well, you know, John, I'm just not ready. Well, then you're choosing to go to hell. I might do it later. Then you're choosing to go to hell. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised a second from now. We're not promised a safe ride home from church. If you're sitting here today and you've never accepted Christ's payment for your sins then you are destined right now to go to hell. But I'm telling you, you don't have to. Jesus paid for your sins. Accept His payment. Don't leave here today without accepting His payment for your sins. That's our first choice. Many of us, if not all of us, have made that choice. I said at one time when I was 16, at a youth rally in Worcester, Massachusetts, my youth leader, Mike Petroselli, said, John, are you ready? I said yes. And I confessed that I was a sinner. And asked Jesus to forgive me. And I accepted his payment for my sins. And at that time, I went from eternal damnation to eternal salvation. You can do the same thing today. That's our first choice. Our second choice is this. Am I going to act like Jesus and humble myself to be a servant? If I accepted his payment for my sins, I now have to say, am I going to emulate him and be a servant? It started with him. Christmas started with Jesus. Humbling himself. Choosing death so we can choose life. And we now have two choices. First choice, am I going to accept his payment for my sins? Second choice. And I need to take his example and humble myself and serve others. Christmas started with him and it ends with us. What are you going to do today? Some of you here might 
You need to come forward in a minute and give your life over to God. Say, God, I'm a sinner. Some of you might have to say, you know what? I need to emulate Him and say, God, I'm going to be humble and serve others. What is your choice today? Let's pray. Father God, I come before you now and I ask you this, that there's someone in here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they'll come forward and get right with you. If there's someone here who is a believer, but isn't living for you, isn't living a humble lifestyle, that they'll come forward and get right with you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Becky comes forward, and as we sing a song, I want you to think, Christmas started with Jesus, and it ends with you. What are you doing? Have you accepted His pain for your sins? Are you choosing to live humbly like Him and serve others? The choice is yours.